Okay, welcome to another Liquid Bullet production. Uh, joining me today, we're continuing with the, um, the Essex case. So, welcome Sasha. Hi Lee. So Sasha, you've got a bit of a background to do with the Essex case and you're in the scene in them sort of years? I have indeed, yeah. Before we, before we go into the case and lots of details about it, can we just roll back to the beginning and get a little bit of brief history about yourself? So I'm an original Essex born and bred and I was the bar maid at Raquel's in 1995 when it all kicked off. Um, my name's Sasha now, um, but that's my name since my page three modelling days. Um, so back then, anybody that knew me back in those days, I was my original birth name, which is Ellen. Uh, so hello everybody, <laughs> good to see you. Um, I was born at Rochford Hospital and lived in Rayleigh. And I stayed in Rayleigh um, right the way through uh, until I left home when I was 16. Um, went off on my way in the world, um, moved up to Chapway, Romford for a few years with my fiance that I got married, uh, got engaged to when I was 16. Uh, but then four years later I moved back to Rayleigh and I started raving in Essex in the Basildon area in 1995. <laughs> <laughs> well, 1994 really, what, before, what that, before that was always... What were the in clubs on them days? So before that, I was a full disco, you know, it was the end of the 80s, uh, I was a full disco diva, and the, it was all about Tots on Lucy Road, and Zero Six, and Club Art, I think it was yeah. then. Um, so yeah, those were the, the kind of the main clubs. Joe Friday's down the seafront, but this was kind of, you know, this is the club scene, but the disco scene, and some of those discos went into kind of the more ravey clubs, as yeah. you say, or house music clubs, as we know them now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was, you know, I was a young 20-year-old 20, 20 having the time of my life um, so far and having, uh, yeah, a lot of fun around the South End, Basildon area. I started clubbing properly as we name it in the kind of clubbing circles, rather than dancing at the disco <laughs> or going down to the meat market, the local meat market. Um, I started clubbing at Adlib in the South End, at the most famous night, I believe, in the South End, Perfect Virtue, which is run by Gary Sutton. And Adlib is where, I, where Ecstasy found me where I found ecstasy um, and that was where it all started for me at Perfect Virtue and Adlib. Now this was an amazing time and before I kind of go any further on the the understanding on all of this is none of it's easy to talk about um, but on the whole drug side of things, before I go any further, I kind of want to kind of put to bed the whole stigmatizing of recreational drug use and how there's, um, I believe, strongly feel that there's a big difference between uh, drug use and drug abuse and alcohol is a drug <laughs> and lots of people take lots of legal drugs and there's lots of illegal drugs and so I did not take any drugs in any way till I was 21 years old which was quite rare because back in like 50 when I was 15 and I was living up near uh, Bannister Green and Felsted in Essex, North Essex. Um, my mum had moved away from South End area when I was 14 and um, we moved up to Felsted. And when I was living there, I'll always remember hearing the raves that were going on all around that area. So it's like all around there is loads of fields and it was notorious and kind of 91, 89, 90, 91, all of that time of when the big raves were going on, the big raves. The big Essex raves uh, the in the fields. The open ones in the fields, yeah. yeah. <laughs> not talking about the club raves. <laughs> um, 
but you know the proper raving I could hear him from my bedroom window and I was like what's that boom 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 <laughs> and I was like that sounds good but I had no idea anything about what that was at all then um, so it was only when I was 21 years old and I was living in the flat above my dad's office and I'd been going to Tots and clubbing the disco scene in South End. And then I went to Adlib and did my first pill in there. And the whole world became a different place. <laughs> 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 and I am not kidding you. <laughs> while, while, we're, while we're talking on the Essex Boys scene, there's, there's quite a good part in the first Rise of the Foot Soldier film that sort of goes through that, isn't it, where he takes it and he's... I haven't seen any of seen them. It, no. <laughs> I have not seen any of them. So, yeah, yeah I'm like, oh, maybe I should watch them at some point. <laughs> kind of boys' films. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of like that train spotting moment, isn't it? And, um, and it, you know, we had no fear. You know, who does when you're 20 years old? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and we had no fear back then of anything, you know, and I'd been getting absolutely leathered on drink since I was 14 years old. And I don't, I don't mean constantly every day at school or anything like that, but, you know, kids go out and start drinking yeah, at this age. Experiment, don't they? Exactly. So it wasn't like I was, you know, I'd left home, I was responsible for myself, all of these kind of things. So. Um, yeah, that's when I took my first pill, and it was ad lib and perfect virtue in South End was an amazing place um, because I met so many friends, and we, you know I don't need to go into here what it's like when you do your first ecstasy, and that's the truth of it. You know we can talk about drugs and everything, but we are talking about ecstasy here, and when we know we're talking about the specific drug. And I'm all for drug education, and obviously this story involves drugs yeah. in every way. Um, and so I am all for education, and I advocate for that across the board. And the narrative that and the demonisation of ecstasy, basically, is something that really I do want to be able to talk about further. Um, whether today, but I'm going to carry on talking about it um, because it is part of the story and it is part of the story because we all know what happened when Leah Betts died or when she took the pill before she'd even died. <laughs> um, so before I go into that, but going back to where I was, so yeah, I've just, I'm at Perfect Virtue, Adlib South End with my cousin and we take our first pill and everybody is our friend and everybody on the dance floor and the world's a brighter, beautiful place and we can't stop dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and we could not stop dancing. And that was it. And that was, that was, you know, I fast forward into it. That was it. Raving for the weekend. We were all living for the weekend then. And it was an amazing time in our scene, in the music scene at that point. Uh, there was parties upon parties, there was, it was all popping off, like, <clears throat> we were, you know, teenagers moving into my 20s, it was the Britplop explosion, uh, Acid House had come, and it was, you know, it was all moving into the clubs, and yes, the Criminal Justice Bill would just start coming in and was trying to stop our fun, <laughs> 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 which is what, you know, I'm sure it's mostly about half the time, but, um, it was, I met loads of friends, we were having a great time, we were living for the weekend, everything was amazing for us. We had no worries at this time and it was all good fun. And it was, none of us were getting into trouble, none of us were fighting, none of us were, you know, and at the time the son's like, oh, those drug takers are killing chickens and eating their heads or whatever it was they said, you know, it was like absolute madness. We were actually all just having a good time and, the, it, you know, abuse wasn't, I'm not saying lots of other people were, but abuse wasn't going on with our crowd. And we were, you know, we we're just starting, we we're just experimenting, all of this kind of thing, and just having a good time. And, and, that's, how, and that's where it was. And then I 
mm, bought a house, number one, Rochester Way, in Basildon. And I bought that house for £33,500, like I was saying earlier. And I bought it because I thought it would be a good place to party in. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that was a, I thought it was a, you know, a good deal as well, but I thought it would be a good place to party in and my friends were there and, and you know, I come from Rayleigh and all of that, but Basden's cheaper. You know, you're starting out, yeah. you haven't got all of this money to go and buy all of these things. So it was a, you know, three bedroom uh, and a terraced house on the Craylands estate in Basildon. And this is, my house was North, a slightly notorious within our group of friends because I was the one that had the house. You know, lots of people still living with their parents and all of this kind of thing at the time. So it was all back to mine after the party. And back to mine happened a lot. It was like, yeah, we're all going back to Sashage. Yeah, well, it was Ellen's, Ellen's at the time. We're all going back to Ellen's. And so, yeah, I was, I was having lots of parties about, yeah, it was all good fun and, Nothing, nothing sordid, nothing particularly bad was going on. Just living your life, living your, living your years, partying away. Yes, yeah, <laughs> you know, can we all talk about when we're 21 and be honest of what we did and <laughs> wonder who's watching and going, oh my God, like, I didn't tell anybody I was doing that when I was 21. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's, that's life, that's how we go out and learn things and... And so, yeah, it was all good fun at this point, and I'm just making my way in the world. And I'm, when I moved into the house in Basildon and bought that house, uh, my best friend at the time, who I'd also bought, uh, um, also met, uh, I'd live in Southend, my best friend and lover girl moved in with me. And she also worked, my best friend also worked in the city, which was where I was working at the time. I was a reinsurance broker for Lloyds of London, being a city girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'd done the whole thing, you know, it was literally train spot, you know, city girl, get a mortgage, get a big television. Yeah, <laughs> spending it there. as it's coming in. <laughs> yeah. And so that was all. That was all happening and we needed extra money, as we all do. And so Kelly was working as a barmaid um, at Raquel's on a Friday night. And Raquel's on a Friday night, for those who remember, was the rave night, as it were. It was the clubbers night. So Raquel's was notorious, absolutely notorious, being rough, and Basden was. And so, you know, I wouldn't, I wasn't ever go. I never, ever went, I never stepped foot in Raquel's any other night other than the Friday night when I worked, really. I've been there a couple of times, I think, before that. Um, but that was it. So it was Friday night, it was fun, a uh, bit of extra money. And so I started working at Raquel's in, I think it was something like March 1995. So, so anyone that's not up to date, I'm sure most people are, but anyone that's not up to date with the whole Essex case. So Raquel's is renowned for the door of Tony Tucker, used to run the door there. Yeah. So this is now your sort of opening scene into that, that world, that connection of it. Yeah. You know, you know, I like it. I knew lots of Essex boys already, <laughs> of all kinds of ages and things like that. Um, Essex boys and Essex girls were all out having fun. Um, but this was my first official job that I ever did in Clubland, was the barmaid at Raquel's. And so it was my first, from being a raver, being a clubber, being just a person on the dance Going floor. Going to the other side of the bar. suddenly <laughs> moved over to the other side. <laughs> Little do you know. <laughs> um, so yeah. <clears throat> That was, to begin with, uh, to be honest, I'd be really honest, you know, when we're going back 30 years, nearly, it's pretty hazy. <laughs> um, 
because there were hazy times in the club. You know, like, you don't remember them like, like no. a memory of that happened and then that happened and then that happened. It's just a, oh yeah, I did that job for a few months and then it all went off. And so what was going on in Raquel's, I got, you know, what actually happened was my best friend that was living with me, she was working at Raquel's and then the girl that was doing the bar, because there's always two girls on each bar, only girls, <laughs> two girls on each bar and she was always working the top bar and the girl that she was working with um, had left off whatever had gone on. I remember something had gone on, but I couldn't say what. And so there was an opening, do you want to come and work at the bar? Yeah, brilliant. So in I went to Raquel's. Now, I, there was no interview going on or anything like that. Do you want to be a barman or anything like that? And the only people that I knew at that time at Raquel's was the promoters. And it's the music side and the promoter side and that side of the club that really hasn't been spoken about a lot at all from what I can gather. And like I said, I, hadn't, I haven't been keeping up to speed. I didn't know everybody was so interested in all this still. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, uh, only when Sky Documentary, uh, Sky Team got in contact with me a couple of years ago, up until then, I hadn't thought about all of this for a long time. Like I said, I haven't seen the films. I haven't, I, I, you know, I just it hadn't come into my remit. So, so I didn't know how much was going on with it all. Um, and it's only since I have that, you know, it's all. It's all, all going down different avenues. It's all going down different <laughs> avenues. So, here we are. It's 1995. Um, I've got my job at Raquel's and I know the promoters because it's the music scene that I'm promoting and I'm still in music and I've been in music pretty much ever since. Like I said, this is my first job in Clubland and the rest is history <laughs> because I'm a I've been a club promoter, I radio, de look after DJs and all this kind of thing. So my love, my love for club culture and my love for the rave scene and the community and all of those things, well, you know, it remains unchanged. It's, it was born of a true love at the time and there's so many magical things about coming together with music and that whole tribal feeling and all of that. And this is what the house music scene was, was for me. And so I followed the DJs, bash the microphone, so I followed the DJs and the music. And so, and because all of our friends, so we did Perfect Virtue at Adlib, Raquel's at Basel on a Friday night, and then it was Berwick Manor, and this was all run by the same promotions team. Um, so it wasn't just Raquel's at Basel and stood alone, it wasn't. The promoters, and anybody knows anything about Clubland, the promoters run clubs at, uh, run a night at that club, and that club, and then they did bank holidays at that venue, that's how it all worked. followed them round, yeah. Exactly, and we all followed them round. So I knew Gary Sutton and John Bradbury, and Gary Sutton was the resident DJ and promoter, and John Bradbury was the resident DJ. Lovely fella, Gary. I know, and like, I, you know. Passed away, didn't he now? God, God rest his soul, yeah. and so, so tragic to, to have lost him so early as well. And I don't know if anybody ever spoke to him no. about all of this. Not that I know of. And it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you know that's kind of why it's important to kind of share your stories you never know what's around the corner um so anyway perfect virtue was much loved and is still much loved and gary and everything he did because a night is made by the by the people behind it and for a night to be like that it has to have love and passion behind it and you know that's that's 
that's what that was all about and that's what we all felt so you know it's everything that's coming together it's the drugs it's the music it's the people it's the community and everything comes together to make you feel that amazing because believe you believe you me if you do a pill on XD and sit in a corner on your own <laughs> you ain't gonna be having that much fun <laughs> 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 so um, and anybody doing drugs on their own ain't going to be having much fun. <laughs> <laughs> or drinking on your own for that matter. But anyway. <laughs> so, Perfect Virtue and everything was much loved and, and that was where the heart is and, and that's where, what I'm all about and that's still what I'm all about. And so, but when we went into Raquel's and I'm starting working as a barmaid, it was a bit different, the lay of the land in Raquel's. <laughs> So all I can describe it as is, I knew, before I even started there, that everyone was on the take. And I mean everyone. <laughs> when, you, when you say on the take, do you mean like from the bar or the...? From every angle. Every angle. From literally, from the door to the bar to the... This is, it was kind of known, I'm not saying about any names, I'm just, it was like, this is just all about making money and not about doing it legally <laughs> as such. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, and it, it's the truth, it's, um, every, just everybody, everybody, there was, we were walking out with crates of hooch at the end of the night, you know, it was, there was a lot of exchanging going on, a lot of exchanging for different things going on in that club. And, and I was earning a lot more money from tips. There's an awful lot of things that have been said that are quite clearly obvious. Uh, one of those being uh, that Mark Murray was the dealer at my bar and Mark Murray was the Raquel's dealer. Um, he wasn't the only person dealing in there, but that's the bottom line. Um, he would always give me a pill at the end of the night and we were told to give him free drinks and this was when I first moved into the club and, and realised that this club was run by the door and it was the door that were in control and it was the door that was scary and it was the door that if they said jump, you jump that high and in the left hand side of my bar was what you would describe as the green room um not much of a green room <laughs> <laughs> uh, more of a white room maybe <laughs> <laughs> um but that was where all the uh what you would describe as the big boys were always in there and the head doorman was the scariest motherfucker <laughs> for us youngsters at that point um, and I would say that I mean I, I didn't even get scared easily but the uh, bully boy doorman uh, that we all know and has been so prevalent in this whole case uh, he scared me because his eyes bulged out of his head all the time, his face was always really scary. And sorry, just when you say bulged out of his head, do you mean like obviously taken something that type of look or just one hundred? Yeah, yeah. And there is a difference between somebody that's done a bit of a or been sniffing their face off hard and drinking hard all night, and that is a, it is a difference, and you can tell it in the energy. I'm. <laughs> I have learnt now, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm a very psychic person, um, and it is one of the things that's kept me safe, I believe, over the years. Uh, I pick up on people's energy, I pick up on the way they look at you, and I've done, done that from a young age. Uh, the way they look at you, uh, it's all in the eyes for me still. <laughs> 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 and it really is, uh, but yeah, he, he, was, he was intimidating. And, and that was how it was. And there was stories of girls, 
other barmaid that he had been going out with um, and stories that I were told. I didn't actually see this happen, but a story, a, a story that I was very much scared me at the time when I was told was that he had been seeing this girl and he took her shoes off and made her take her shoes off and then was smacking her shoes on her feet going, dance, bitch, dance. Well, this was inside the club or out? Inside the club. Inside the club. So, these are stories. That's a story that I heard, but this is one of the things that is used to put the fear of God in people. And the fear of God in, you know, just do as you're told, just do what they say, don't ask no questions. Simple as that. So that was the what I would describe as the yin and the yang of this thing, this night, this scene for me. I never felt anything like this at Adlib. I never felt anything like this, but this was what I would describe as the dark side and the intimidating, kind of threatening side, which didn't fit with everything else that was going on with us all having fun doing these and, 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 and you know, all of that kind of thing. So that's how it was. And, but they, I will say this, Mark was always very nice to me. Um, Mark was a flash harry. <laughs> it would be known to be a flash harry, but he didn't scare me. He never scared me. He never said anything nasty to me. He didn't scare me. Um, and I never saw, I never knew, of course, the Essex boys, whatever the Essex boys, the three of them, I'm sure they were in there at different times, but they were just another guy to me. How would I have known them? There was, they, I never, they were never, they weren't involved in any way, I'd never heard their names before all this happened. Oh, really? Wow, that's interesting. That's the truth, 100% truth. I never knew any of those three. I know mates that knew them, but obviously, for starters, they're a lot older than me. You know, two of them were in their mid 30s, I'm 21. Um, and I think, um, was it? Was it Craig that was 26? Yeah, the younger one, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Craig was more kind of my age group, and so I might have more come into contact with him. But there was no, they may well have been one of the boys that were in the green room, who knows? I didn't, I wasn't being introduced to any of them or that kind of thing. But yeah, no, I had not ever heard of them at all before their, their deaths. Um, so that's how it was. Uh, the only person that I remembered and knew very clearly was obviously the DJ. <laughs> um, who, who was the DJ back then? Just Gary so, or? Was... So John Bradbury was, I, I hit him up. So John Bradbury was the resident DJ. Gary Sutton was the promoter DJ. Yep. Uh, but John was just the DJ. Not that it's just a DJ, but you know. <laughs> um, and Oh, we were quite matey with John, and uh, John was a lovely guy, and he was playing on those last nights, and that last night he was the DJ. Um, so I knew the DJ, I knew the Perfect Virtue crew, I can't remember all the girls' names, the two of them, um, and they were working in, on the door, i.e as the promoter works, yeah. the door does the door, but the promoter's sitting behind the desk taking the ticket money because they're the promoters for the promotion. <clears throat> and so I knew that lot, and I knew my mates, and I knew Mark, and I knew Bernie. And, and that was it. Looking back with an older woman's eyes, obviously one of the things that was Raquel's was notorious for was underage which didn't really occur to me at the time, obviously, because I'm still young myself, even though I'm, I'm not underage. I've been going out to discos till, since I was 14. So I'm not gonna be like, that person's underage, am yeah. I? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it was, it was a really, really young club. And, um, and that was all I 
I, I kind of know really. Um, and then we hit November 95 and the first week of November 95, and I'm not going to go into it today, and it's a whole big story, but the first week on the Friday night, so Friday night at Raquel's, I get off the train and something occurred at my house with Essex Police. And I'm finding, trying to find out more about that now. But this was exactly one week, exactly one week before Leah Betts's party the f weekend after. So this incident, which I will <laughs> divulge more about at a later date, this incident happened. Then I went off to work at Raquel's as normal on fr that Friday night. Everything was normal, carried on, even though it had been a, a load of drama had gone on for me, carried on as normal, normal Friday night at Raquel's. Fast forward to the next week, normal Friday night at Raquel's, end of the night, Mark gives us a pill to go home with, as he always did. And uh, we went home and did it. Because I didn't do them when I was work. Well, I tried not to. <laughs> I was always like, oh my God, I can't count. <laughs> so, I, I know, you know, I, I like to think I'm responsible with these things. Um, and so we went home and did it. and. Those pills that I was given that night, those two pills that we were each given that night, were apples. So apples, an apple ecstasy pill is the same pills that, or the same pill that Leah Betts took. But I also know people that took them in Scotland, and I think <laughs> this is a batch. Who knows how many there were? Mm. You know, obviously these went across the country. Anyway, so what I do remember, and this is why I do vividly remember it, I do remember that they were strong. And what I, and on that basis of the fact that nothing we can handle. But that they were like, whoa, that you know, that that was a good one. <laughs> That's how it is. You know, I'm I'm being honest. Um, that was a good one, and I remember it really well because we were like, oh man, you know, and that was it. That was it. Then, the ne very next night is the day of Leah Betts' party at her father and stepmother's house. And <sighs> this is another whole podcast that I would like to move into and delve into and story that I'd like to delve into because I really want to, it's one of the reasons that I'm here, it's one of the reasons that I'm doing this. Um, there's been so much talk about these three boys' death and of course there's been an awful lot of talk about Leah's death as well. But I will, I want to ask everybody first and foremost to look carefully at this whole scenario of what's happened. And I know there's a lot of people that are, have, uh, it's always been linked, hasn't it, Lee? And so the truth of this young girl who, everybody, well, of the truth of this young girl who's 18th birthday party, and from what I know is this, that Leah Betts wasn't living with her parents. And that you, may describe, you know, some people would describe it as troubled, I'd describe it as not an easy start or not an easy life or whatever. Um, so this is from what I know and this is a lot of what Sky cut out, as in the fact of the truth of Leah's life up until then, the truth of everything that was going on for her, I don't think has ever been investigated and the truth of actually what happened that night and how that come to pass and how this girl became the pin-up of her death 
She wasn't dead in these pictures. She's in a coma. Mm. Now, I don't know how many dads or parents out there that when their child is just in a coma and just been rushed to hospital on their 18th birthday, already, within the next 24 hours, is putting all those flyers out of... I ask fathers, loving fathers out there, is this going to be the first thing on your mind? Definitely not. Not for me, anyway. So, <clears throat> I do believe there's a serious amount of manipulation that has gone on around this whole, um, the death of this young girl. And, you know, let's, let's be honest, she was only just an adult. Only just. And this happened at her parents' house, or her, mother, her dad's house and not her mother's. And I didn't know this until recently, that her mother di had died three, four years beforehand. Now, any, anybody losing their mother is difficult. Yeah, when, you age. when you lose your mother at you know, 15, <coughs> 15 years old, of course, you, it's very easy to go off the rails in it, lots of ways. And you're gonna need a lot of support and a lot of help and all of these kind of things. And I don't know the whole story. Um, but my heart goes out to her still, and it actually does make me feel quite emotional as to once somebody's, well, first of all, though she's in a coma, and um, and then and then she's lost her life, and she never got a chance to say anything about anything, and about anything that happened, about what she'd done, or anything. And suddenly, within 48 hours, Monday, oh no, Sunday, and I think I'm right, and, every, and we need to go back to the newspapers for this. The party happens on Saturday night. The News of the World is a Sunday paper. It's out in the News of the World the next day. Yeah, so if you think about that, really, that's quite a quick turnaround, isn't it? Time the death's reported for the news to be able to print that story and have it out for five, four, five in the morning when it goes to print. Well, somebody's given them the information. Yeah. It's not like everybody's got the news of the world on radar, is it? What happened for me on that side is, obviously, I had no idea about this, and but it's kind of kicked off in the news of the world. It's not like we were all buying the news of the world on a Sunday, like, <laughs> we weren't, but it's all suddenly started to, it's gone into the papers, and everybody is suddenly talking about it, and this, all of a sudden you've got your friends or your family going, oh, I've seen this in the newspaper, oh, I've seen this in the newspaper, and we're like, oh, just don't talk about it, like, because at this point, we're all like, oh, everybody's talking about drugs. Everybody's talking about this girl doing the pill, and everybody, every, like, literally, I dread to think how many youngsters were in this Essex area were then suddenly called by somebody going, Are you doing drugs? Are you doing drugs? Are you doing drugs? Uh, I remember when it first came out, it was crazy when it all over the news, the newspapers, it just went viral everywhere. There was no internet at this stage or anything like that. So, so this is all kicked off, and I'm going about my normal week, gone to the city. And then Friday night, it's Raquel's again. So we now know, and I, we, I know, now know the dates and the timing. This is, she went into a coma on the Saturday night. She died on the Thursday. So they turned the machine off, I imagine, on the Thursday. So that's the Thursday. Friday, we turn up for work at Raquel's and the whole world's press was there. And I, can, I will never forget that night of driving around my normal route, driving into Market Square and up to Raquel's. And literally it was Sky, it was BBC.